Hereford Awareness uh, Alliance for Drug Awareness. Um, I promised them they could go first tonight because at our last meeting in the fall they, they went last and it was, uh, it was a rather long meeting so um, a lot of people had already had to leave. Uh, but they're doing great work in, in the community and uh, Paper and Mimi are here to talk about that so if you want to come up. Um, just as they're coming up to, to the podium and they'll talk for a little bit. Um, they are going to have a table um, that the township's involved with at the community day uh, in 2017, and that's this Saturday um, at Rose Tree Park in Media. Um, and thank you. Just, and, and just one second. Just so you know, we are recording this because we're going to put this online so others who couldn't attend can see this. So we're getting a microphone just to make it easier to hear the voices. Um, so you'd stand at the podium. That'd be great. So what, I, I, before they get started, just a little background on this organization. It's, it's essentially an organization that, that formed grassroots just by people in our community. And it's essentially simply the, the main goal is to raise awareness uh, of heroin and opioid addiction that exists in Delaware County and the country, but, but particularly here in Hammertown. Uh, and the goal is if we, if we raise the awareness and we start conversations within the community, uh, that's how we as a community can help solve this problem uh, and help people, uh, our fellow residents who have brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, uh, who are suffering from this disease now. Um, and they've made a great progress uh, through the year and we, there's been several presentations made at the high school. Um, and, and other events. One was at St. Dennis, uh, and they've had 150 to 300 people at each event. So progress has been made, um, and Peggy. Hi, I'm Peggy Murr, and I live in the Fourth Ward, I'm happy to say. And today the township was there trimming the trees at Foster Track with the pollen, and I have a terrible <laughs> allergy, so I hope you can hear me. But I just wanted to update you on a few things, because we gave you the presentation at the last meeting. What I wanted to tell you was, we have some bad news, unfortunately. Haverford Township, between January 1st and the end of March, we had, and this is just police saves, we had seven ODs, five were reversed, thank God, because our police carry Narcan. And the EMS folks say that it's usually four times as much for, for them. So if you're considering seven ODs, in just three months, it's getting worse rather than better. But there is some good news on the horizon, if you can find any. The good news is Pennsylvania never had a drug reporting a national basis, a statewide basis. Now we do as of August of last year. So if someone's going to get an opioid prescription where most people seem to be getting hooked and they go doctor shopping, that's gonna show up now. So you can't go to five doctors. That's being monitored now. We expect to see some positive results from that. The other good news is if you walk into the ER or to urgent care, before doctors were pre prescribing 30 days worth of opioids, they're not doing that anymore. You're lucky to get five days. So that's a really good thing. Through this group, through um, the commissioner's newsletters, through our education, we're getting the word out to the grown-ups, and we're getting the word out through the youth. That's, I'm happy to see the Y here because the Y is our partner. We've done events at the YMCA. We're going to do more. We met with the Haverford High School principal last night. So we're making inroads there as well. But we still have a huge problem. Part of the big problem is the heroin is 94% pure. And our folks and our young people in Haverford Township, they're leaving here, they're going to rehab and they're coming back to Haverford Township and they have no support um, to fall back on. They're going back to their old ways and to their old habits. So we have a generation of folks in their 20s and 30s that are addicted and they're not being helped. Again, the youth are being helped. We're getting the word out to the grown-ups, but we need to worry about this <coughs> 20 and 30s something. So we believe and professionals have taught us this, that if you, if someone comes out of rehab and they can go into a recovery <coughs> house for at least two or three weeks and not go back to the same friends and to the same ways, 
that can be very beneficial. And I'm going to have Mimi Baldwin come up and tell you a little bit about what our group just did and talk to you a little bit about recovery houses. Hi, my name is Mimi Baldwin, and I live in the fourth ward. And um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about, first of all, our fundraiser that we had the end of March. We had a Stand Up for Recovery comedy night. And um, we earned about $7,000, which is going towards scholarships to recovery houses. And they're for current or former Havertown residents. Um, so what we would do is if we get a report from the counselor, they have someone from Havertown who is really serious in their sobriety, um, you know, then we would just talk to them about possibly getting a placement for them in a recovery house. And to start, we would fund the first two weeks for them. Um, that would give them enough time to find a job, get themselves established, um, so they can start paying their own way. But they needed somebody to help them just to get started. So um, we had a lot of donors. We had we sold pizza, we sold coffee, we sold pretzels, all of which was donated from some really generous um, businesses in the area. Um, for those of you that don't know what a recovery house does, that are lucky to not know about a recovery house, it's uh, a house that it's more like a controlled environment for someone that's coming out of rehab. And um, it almost forms like a family because a lot of times when addicts are coming out of rehab, they don't really have much connection left with their family. They've burnt a lot of bridges. Um, this teaches them the importance of a family environment, um, the importance of social activities that don't include drugs or alcohol. Um, it teaches them responsibility as far as chores, uh, contributing to the house. They have um, certain things that they have to, you know, they're expected to do. They have to make so many meetings a week. They have to be drug tested regularly. And I know that there is a uh, recovery house in Broomall that my son um, knew a lot of people. I, my son is in recovery. Um, and they were tested regularly. And if you fail the test, you were out. And this was one of the better run recovery houses. Um, so this is really what we're looking to place these people in if we can help them. Um, so I don't know any other anybody have a question about the recovery house and what it does? Are they staffed? It, yeah, there's actually what's called a house manager, and that's someone that has a pretty good amount of time in sobriety that um, wants to take on the task of managing the house. So, you know, they monitor and that the... person is employed by the state or by a... No, they're not employed. They live there. And oh. I guess they don't have to pay the weekly fee, um, but they have to manage the property and manage the residents in it. So. Hey, where is this house? Um, it's in... Br the one that I'm aware of is in Broomall. But there, they're there, all over there's the There's lots of houses yeah, all over the place. All over. And what, yeah. what happens is somebody will have a certain period of time in rehab and, and they'll get out and it'll be just go home. Um, and you're sort of placed back in the same environment that you, you, you were in beforehand. And what this does is give, give a buffer for, for someone uh, between the time in rehab and sort of reintegrate essentially into society. And, it, and it, you know, studies have shown that it, it really does uh, increase uh, the, the likelihood of, of success for, for someone to stay clean. So what, what, what Mimi and Peggy are talking about is this group that is formed, um, it really has been, this is sort of like the next step for them as a group. They, they began sort of grassroots just sort of preaching the message that, look, this is happening here, this is happening to our, our kids, to our, our, our neighbors, um, and we need to be aware, and, and this is sort of the outgrowth of it. Um, and, and also, the, we at the township and, and then the board of commissioners certainly want to support that in any way possible. So, and we thank, we thank them for what they're doing. I mean, what they're doing, and what Mimi does by going to events like this and speaking up about that as her role and her son being in recovery, it, it puts a face to it and it, it, it makes you know it makes it all real for us. So I you know, thank her tremendously. I also wanted, I wanted you to know that these two commissioners have been very nothing but supportive from day one since we've organized and also the policemen that are sitting in back here. It's not an easy fight. We know that everyone says we can't arrest our way out of this because it starts with opioids. So we're trying to all work together, and uh, I wanted to let you know, also Sunday there's a canine competition, a little commercial here at the high school, and there's a vendor there, a caterer, that has free food. It's going to be free food, but it's all donation, and the donation is going to come to HADA. So that's a wonderful thing. So thank you very much. If anyone's in...
12 noon, 12 noon. it starts. Any of the food, if you buy it, please give a donation and it'll come to us. And if any of you are interested, we do have a Facebook site with some, a lot of good information. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you. And a couple of things. If you need recycling calendars, we have additional ones here and stickers. And we have plenty more for recycling cans. So. You can buy your own and put, they request you put two stickers on each can so that they know what to pick up. So they're here and they're always available from us in addition. The second uh, presentation, um, we have a number of boards and committees. One of the most active uh, in the township is the Environmental Advisory Committee. We have two representatives here from the uh, committee to discuss briefly some of their activities, Peter Puglianese and Aurora Dizel, who's my uh, representative from the fourth ward on the committee. Uh, also putting rain garden cards on the table if you are interested in a rain garden or you want to sign up. We could, uh, and I'll explain what they are in a moment. If you could, okay. <clears throat> Last time I was here, I briefly explained rain gardens. Can, can you use the mic so that... Sorry. I briefly explained rain gardens the last time I was here, and they said, well, don't you have anything we could look at? All right, so uh, I'm Peter Polianisi. Um, so the Environmental Advisory Committee a few years ago was actually asked to look at stormwater authorities as a way to fund uh, infrastructure improvements for stormwater. And we, uh, we kind of shied away from that because it was new and cutting edge and we felt we weren't ready for it. But one of the things we did was we started a program to, for education uh, to uh, build rain gardens. We're building 10 rain gardens a year. Uh, any resident of uh, Haverford who is interested in a rain garden can submit, uh, email, take a card, email us. Um, and um, we will assess your house and see if it's suitable for a rain garden. We actually evaluate them and rate them, and the top 10 uh, each year we build rain gardens. Um, your neighborhood, where are they? Well, there's actually a new one in the park, in Paddock Park, uh, which was uh, built by, I think, the YMCA. Um, there's one on Prescott. Um, which is in the front yard. Um, there's a great photograph we have of that uh, where the street was about 9 to 12 <laughs> inches underwater and the rain garden was still accepting rainwater. It hadn't uh, filled up yet or overflowed, uh, but it was filling up. So the idea is to slow the flow, basically, of the rain, uh, to catch it, to hold it on site for a day or so, and then let it percolate uh, into the ground. Filter any pollutants out. And, and also, if enough of these get done in enough places to minimize the flow, uh, to minimize the flooding. Okay, so flooding uh, in an older community like ours has gotten worse over 30, 40 years as we built more um, houses that are older than that really didn't have any way to hold uh, uh, stormwater runoff. People had, in cer certain cases, dirt or strip driveways, paved them. Over the years, more and more impervious surfaces get built, and more and more of the rainwater just sheds very, very quickly. So that adds to the flooding. So we have a few hot spots in the township uh, that uh, were trying to focus on. Um, we also, we're out, this uh, year we're focusing on Mailers Run, and we're also trying to interest businesses. So if you have uh, a, a business in the community, um, uh, a lot of our businesses are in, you know, so, uh, sort of built into residential type of structures. If you think it might be something you're interested in, we'd be happy to come and take a look and assess your property, where I, I think in the fall, during the music festival, we're going to build one at a, a quad uh, right on East Darby Road, we hope. We're going to do the assessment. 
So um, what is a rain garden? A rain garden basically is the opposite of your typical landscape mound. Okay, so instead of building uh, a mound and covering it with mulch and planting some shrubs on it, we build a depression, okay, and we, we find where the rainwater is coming from, roof drains, driveways, can we get the rainwater to flow into the garden uh, and accumulate maybe a couple of inches of rain, store it, infiltrate it. We plant with water-loving plants. Um, a lot of them are very beautiful. Some of them are very familiar to you. Common flowers, bee balm. Um, but uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of ornamental grasses. So uh, they're, they tend, they're beautiful gardens, just like any garden that you plant from scratch in a grassy area, it takes a year or two to establish and a little bit of care. Once it establishes, it pretty much takes care of itself and it does a little bit of work in terms of um, getting it established and then probably less work. Why? Because you're not watering it. Uh, they not only are water tolerant, they <coughs> tend to be drought tolerant plants. So you're pretty much leaving it alone, and it's doing the work of uh, slowing the flow of water. So that's what it's about. We um, have a little bit of grant money. We have a lot of volunteers, if anyone's interested in volunteering. Uh, if you want to see what it's about, that's a good way to see what it's about, is come out and see one built. Uh, if you send us an email, tell us you want to volunteer, you're interested in a, a garden, and you want an assessment, and we'll get you on the list. And, uh... Yeah, um, I have some pamphlets too if you want a little bit more information about rain gardens. And um, I also wanted to plug real quick Earth Day, Haverford Earth Day, which is coming up this Saturday. And I'm excited about it because um, the EAC has planned a lot of exciting things for this year. It's from 9 to noon at the Crack, and we're actually raising money there for the Haver Rain Garden uh, project as well. Um, there's going to be you can test drive Ford Focus and C-Max plugins. Um, there's going to be a lot of family-friendly things there, guided trail walks, beekeepers, compost, all kinds of activities. Um, what What's the really, time? It's, it's from 9 to noon. 9 to noon. And if you take a test drive in uh, one of the Ford vehicles, they will donate $20 to the Rain Garden program. We also have um, two raffles that's going to benefit the Rain Garden program as well for some gift cards to Giant mm -hmm. and Moms Organic Market. Um, if anyone is into motorcycles, you can sign mm -hmm. up. You could uh, take a card to Crossroads Motorsports and test drive a zero electric motorcycle, which is really cool. Uh, and they will also donate $20 to the program. They're not going to be able to come out on Saturday, but I'm going to bring mine so you can look at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so other than Earth Day, I also just wanted to say if anyone has interest in environmental issues and rain gardens and you want to learn more, um, EAC meetings are open to the public. So first Tuesday of the month at 7.30, um, anyone is welcome to come and um, listen or give input or whatever. And they're here, right? Yes, they're here in the other meeting room. And if you live in the third ward, if you wanted to see one, the, the Merwood Park Civic Association planted one in Merwood Park, Merwood Park. Uh, right behind the uh, right behind the swing set last year. Um, and you, you know, just from being down there last weekend, the the, the flowers are starting to come back. The uh, biggest and best that's most established, if you, you guys are familiar with the Haverford Reserve, the so the first soccer field that you come to <coughs> as you're driving by, you'll notice about a 200-foot planted swale and then a bigger garden area at the bottom. That's a rain garden. Looks beautiful, does a lot of work. So what I didn't fully understand about rain gardens when I was first learning about them, so I'm just gonna say it in case there's anyone else who doesn't, <coughs> is reducing the flooding is, it impacts our waterways, like Darby Creek and all our local streams and creeks. Um, so when it, you know, and that impacts the, the things that live there and the health of the streams. And that's why it's so important to try to get a better handle on our stormwater. Now, I will say also, think about not making things worse, which is to say uh, you don't have a paved driveway. You pave it, you're going to have more runoff, okay? Uh, so you 
build an addition, well, a lot of those things require evaluation and offsets, right? Right. They, they do. They, they, they do. They definitely do. <laughs> okay. So, um, and all those things need permits, and so you should be, before doing, you should be uh, getting that determination. But I actually have, myself, I have an old driveway with two concrete strips on it. I don't know if you've ever seen them. And um, so it, between the strips, it holds a lot of water, and then the water goes away within a few hours. And, it's, uh, you know, if you take that and you pave it, or you take a driveway and you go double wide with it, you're just adding to the flow and the, and the problems. Thank you. other before we open it up for questions um, we have representatives here from the YMCA uh, and we have Dave Mullen who is the I guess the CEO or the director and Katie Cox CEO and, <laughs> and, yeah, and what's interesting is take a look at Eagle Road now down in that area and you'll see how it's really developing uh, you'll see the, the the streetscaping but in front of now the uh, Mr. Storage that was begun by the YMCA, which is part of our master plan. But the YMCA was the first piece, and they have been wonderful neighbors, and a lot of what we've done and accomplished is because of the, the YMCA. We have Tom Kelly here, Kelly Music, who helps us with, runs the music fests, and it's within our community that we're really seeing a lot of change. And just so you know, um, that even as many years as you've been there, I look today, I still get the sixth most popular page on my website is still your, the YMCA. So people are still looking. Good. But now I'll leave it to them to give you an update and then take any questions. Thank you, Dan and Kevin, for inviting us again. I think this is our fourth year being at this meeting, so uh, happy to come always. Um, I have our senior program director, Katie Koch, with us, and uh, Marty Burke, who is our new property director. So I just wanted to put some... Uh, faces to names for our operations. Um, I only have a few quick updates. I'm going to talk about some things that um, you know we've updated from this meeting last year to now, and then obviously we're happy to answer questions at the end. Um, so we are three and a half years old in this town. Um, those of you who may not know, we were the former Mainline Y in Ardmore, uh, which closed in October of 13. Um, we came over. That was our smallest Y in our organization, which has 18 locations. Um, we are now uh, proud to say that our membership has grown to about 12,000 um, plus units, uh, which is equivalent of 27,000 individuals. Um, that is a staggering number. We're in the top 1% of the country, and we're very proud about that because I think it shows that the community had a need and the Y is here to uh, fulfill that need. <clears throat> some, some facts around those numbers. Um, of our 12,000 plus units, about 75% of them are families or single parent families, uh, which is two of our membership categories, um, which is what the Y is really all about. It's about child care, it's about teaching kids to swim and having families come together. Um, just under 50% of our total membership is from the 19083, so I think that again shows that uh, folks in town uh, needed our service or at least wanted them and they're, they're you know, happy to be members. Um, even though we did grow to the 27,000, um, we track scan rates into our facility, so you can't get into our facility unless you're a member and you have to scan in to show that your membership is valid. Um, so some, some months that we pulled year over year, um, January of this year, we had a mild winter, so our numbers were up a little bit. Um, but just last month, March of 17, our foot traffic through the door, which is cars in our lot, was down from the two previous years. Um, I think that shows uh, the ebbs and flows of the nice weather. Folks are using Pensy Trail and they're exercising out, but they're still maintaining their membership. So our membership numbers are up, but um, activity through our front doors stayed pretty uh, consistent. Uh, we also tracked May of 16 to May of 15 and June of 16 to June of 15, and the numbers are all just about the same, 65,000 per month. Um, so uh, the impact is there, but the, the people coming through the door has been pretty consistent year over year. Um, some other things that I wanted to mention, we, 
Um, I talked at this meeting last year that we did, um, we know our, we don't have enough parking spots for the amount of folks that want to come all the time. So uh, we still, seven days a week, 8 to 12, um, have our park ops company that we hired. And they're on site directing traffic, trying to make our lot a lot safer for that heavy volume of 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, obviously, that need for those guys goes down significantly when there's no snow or it's nice weather, but we maintain that until we feel the lot is safe. Um, we did add a staff-only parking lot at the intersection of um, Eagle and Lawrence, and the intersection work um, is scheduled to start tomorrow again and be done by the end of the month, weather permitting. So that is something that will be wrapped up uh, very shortly. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Katie. Katie's got some updates about programming and things we're doing in the community. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Kosh. I am the Senior Program Director at the Y. I have been here before, and I've seen some of you before. Um, so I just want to talk about how we do try to be a friend of the community and how we support a lot of local businesses and nonprofits in the area. Um, just, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, we made contact with someone over at the Skadium. We were putting their... Um, made some contact and last week we were able to send a, a group of our holiday camp kids down to the stadium which was a really great experience for them and it was it was great to get that partnership together um, someone in the crowd tonight Chris Kowalski's kids actually went ice skating there for the first time they had a great time smiles on their faces so it was really great to partner we walked the Penzi Trail did a little you know science nature walk and then went over there had lunch and it was a really great experience so another um, great community um, partnership that we have um, other community partnerships we use McKenna's Kitchen Tony Roney's Belvedere's uh, Floral a lot of those we use on a consistent regular basis to support the local businesses um, we also work with some nonprofit organizations how to we work with them as well um, I'm not sure if you're coming to our healthy kids day next weekend but we would love to have you um, so we'll certainly be in touch about that. Um, Healthy Kids Running Series. I'm not sure if any of your kids are come, going to that. It is in uh, Paddock Park um, across the street from us, but tomorrow night we'll be um, setting up a table in our lobby so people can pick up their bibs there, and then we'll also be having a volunteer table. So we'll be helping out, helping run the event um, with uh, some of the people that are running the event um, all five of those weeks. Um, Cradles to Crayons. We um, set up in our lobby a big... Um, over, over the holiday um, donated um, used toys and clothing drive and it was an overwhelming success. We had I think like two trucks fulls um, right around the holidays which was really really amazing and then some of our staff went and about 25 of us went down and volunteered um, for a couple hours down there so that was a really great experience. Um, some programs that we are running that are some fun programs I mentioned Healthy Kids Day. It is next Saturday. It is a free program to anybody in the community. It's going to be a great time. Even if you're not a member, stop by. There's going to be moon bounces for the kids, golf sale, which is always a big hit. Um, we have a lot of just local groups that come in and they talk about what they do and, and how they help the community. It is a free event for vendors. It's a free event for the, the community. So come out and have a good time. Free food. So if, if that's not a, you know. Way to sell it. Um, we also have ESL for um, English as a Second Language. That is a program that we offer um, once a week uh, at the Y. It is free for the community. So if this, if English is your second language, um, please spread the word. And uh, we've been filling the room every week for it, but it's been a really great success, and people are are coming out to it and, and getting a good experience. Like I said, it's free to the community. You do not have to be a member. Uh, Blood drive, we do have a blood drive coming up. I know there are a lot of blood drives in the area, but we have them about three times a year. So we'll certainly spread more, more news about that. The next one's coming up June 15th. So stuff that, yeah, yes. I have a quick question. Sure. I've been around the back on my bike and admired the vegetable gardens back yes. there. So who um, does, who maintains those? Yes, actually Where that's, does it go? that is, um, and I actually forgot to mention that. So that is our, um, our vegetable garden is run by one of our volunteers, Randy, who was amazing. He, the first year he really had it up and running, he donated, we were donated about 1,500 um, pounds. Last year his goal was to make over a ton and he donated, we donated over 2,500 pounds. It goes to the Ardmore Food Pantry, most of it does, um, but all of it is organic produce and it all gets donated. So it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he <laughs> takes a lot of pride in that, in that yeah. garden. He's there 40 hours a week even in the winter, maintaining it. So he does a really great job. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
You also had, um, we had the Haverford Partnership for Economic Development is, is an organization in town um, that's really striving to, you know, do exactly what it says, which is develop uh, economically the businesses in the, in the community. And, and they had recently had a meet and greet. I believe it was last month, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we had that in the lobby of the Y, uh, and we invited all the local businesses uh, to come and interact, and hopefully they can use, they can, you know, share each other's business and, and, and order, order from each other, sort of what you were talking about. Um, but the Y really presented sort of like this, a, a great example of, of where Havertown is now and where it's going for, for the businesses. Um, so that's, that's part of how, you know, the Y is working sort of with the township, with some community organizations um, to sort of uh, show off what we have now and, and the options we have in this town and, and you know the, the to show off to a business um, that you have 20 you have you have all these members going to this this place in town it is a good thing so um. we live in the fourth ward around the corner from the Y and we've been living here this summer will be 45 years in our house and while the traffic on Evil Road drives me crazy I have to say that the Y has literally changed the face of Eagle Road. And I joined about three months ago, and there's it's just <coughs> wonderful energy in there. All the I'm in the active adult program, and all the instructors are wonderful, and I just, uh, I'm just thrilled. Every time, I'm very proud of it when I, I tell people all the time, you have to come see how beautiful the Y is. They just, it's just an amazing transformation since we, when they first closed the bubble gum factory, I was pretty upset. <laughs> we used to drive by and smell gum every night, so it was nice that it was laying dormant all those years, so we're happy to have you. Going into the place here, there's a stop sign directly down from where you enter the Y. It really needs a sign that it cross traffic does not have a stop sign. I, I have avoided an accident many times there because... What's which the intersection? Talking? Uh, it, it's on. The, it's in the parking lot of the Y. Of the Y, directly down from the, the door where you enter. There is a stop sign. Okay. The traffic oh, coming okay. in just oh, keeps so moving. moving. But if yeah. you really need a sign to remind people that cross traffic does mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. have a stop sign on both sides of it, because mm -hmm. people have pulled out in front mm -hmm. of me several times. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That's why this guy's here. <laughs> <laughs> and the other more, thing uh, I had a question I'm is, sorry. when are you going to finish the sidewalk in front of the Parking that yeah. is really terrible. You can't tomorrow. walk on that side of the street. That, that project resumes tomorrow, and we've been told that it should be done by the end of this month. And the other, other thing, and I don't know whose trail is the Fancy Trail, but I belong to that neighborhood patch thing that people put things in. Apparently, there is, it's just got a horrible amount of ticks. A woman was walking for a dog, and she said she was only on the trail for a very short period, and she pulled five ticks off of her door. I don't know. People, I don't know. Spray for yeah, there. Unfortunately, you can't spray for that, and that's a problem. Not only it's every park in the in the particular area, and the only thing we can do with our health department, we actually put things on a website is to actually promote, um, you know, prevention. Make sure that you put uh, uh, proper uh, tick, um, you know, spray and things like that. We, you know, you don't know. In fact, there uh, are. Uh, our uh, director uh, of uh, codes enforcement, Mr. Celia, actually went to the crack yesterday to look at a down wire behind the building, and he was bit. Um, he actually <laughs> saw it today, and it, it actually occurred that quick. He's already had the ring, and it's a, it's a deer tick. So well, we have right deer right. In, in the property. Um, you know, my granddaughter, unfortunately, was up at the last month, and, and we pulled one out of her, her head. They're all over the place. There's nothing we can do. Um, at a township level, and, and we've notified the county, and there's really not much we can do about it. The tick problem, no matter where you go, uh, and it's not just, I uh, spoke to Mr. Mar um, uh, uh, Joe Romano at Marple Township. Uh, they're all experiencing pretty much the same issues, but they're all over the place. It could be worse because we didn't have a long enough Could be. The ones on the Pen okay. Pensy Trail the seem to be the wood ticks, though. The wood ticks, yeah. Yeah, on Pensy Trail. Other questions for the why? Because once they're done, then we'll let them leave, and then we can. Do the rest. Hi, I'm a member of the why, and um, actually, I'm able to walk. But I noticed that the some of the employees from the nail salon are using the upper parking lot. Um, I brought it to the attention of the front desk. It, you know, this was just like two weeks ago, 
and um, they, they told me how another member of the Y sat there one day and wrote down all the license plate number of the employees and, you know, left it at the front desk. So um, she said, you know, apparently it was addressed, but it looks like they are starting to use it again. I, you know, I don't know if we can put someone up at the other line or have them towed, you know. Yeah, the, the changing of the calendar, we've met with that those guys three or four times. It, it goes away and it comes back. back and right. them. So oh, we'll, we'll reach out to them again. Yeah, towing does prevent it. <laughs> yeah, I believe we can't it. because we don't have the signage. You have to yeah, you'd, you'd hit the right. Once, once yeah. the construction is done, you'll have the signage. I don't know if it's something you can address, but um, it would be nice for the people that live in the neighborhood if uh, off of Belvedere, they could be a little more pedestrian friendly getting into the Y. Uh, you've got that little trail where the Pensy Trail starts and that one way uh, uh, dead end road. When the parking lot's getting a little full, it's a little dicey trying to uh, navigate that and all the cars that are dodging the house during that heavier times. Some crosswalk stop signs. I don't know how you would mitigate that or okay. address it. Would it be nice if a little more friendly? Okay. Where is that entry? Yeah. Just so right. it's on Ralston. Yeah, Ralston. Yeah, off the crosswalk. Yeah, off the crosswalk. Yeah. It does get. It's crazy. I mean, I live right there, and it's um the amount of people that walk on the on Ralston into that back way. The good thing about, uh, one of the many good things about Marty is he's a third generation Habitat guy, so he knows. It's not unique in the room, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's all those people that you built here cut through. But... I know where you go. We've got our business cards we can follow up. Um, we need some cards and we'll make sure we stay connected. Uh, hi, David. <coughs> Brendan Goggin from hi, Brendan. the Third Ward. Now you guys, I just wanted to comment uh, how much I, I appreciate why my, my family's a family membership. My wife's probably one of the first people there every morning. Every morning. morning. Door. And she's also make sure that she's up at 12 midnight to make sure she gets in the shot glass before anyone else. Um, at any rate, uh, we've, we've really warmed up to it. I, just, I, I, I can't say enough how much as a, I'm not a business owner in the Third Ward, but also as a resident of the Third Ward. Uh, just this type of coming out and getting reports, and I've always seen you folks out and about. You've been a great welcome in the neighborhood, uh, both for the businesses and the residents, and I commend you on all the efforts that you do to try to blend in with the neighborhood and try to make the community better. So, cheers to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The traffic light in front of the Y, backing up about a year, year and a half before that, it seems to me that they've got the lights tied between Route 1, Township Line, and County Line, and Ardmore. They were all synchronized, so I was told when I read the news of Delaware County. And it, it took about a year and a half, and it seemed to get streamed out. The day they turned the new light on in front of the Y, it's like putting a cork in a drain. And all my, and I thought it was just my thing. A lot of my neighbors, I lived the one hundred block of Ellis Road, the second block off of Darby. And it just seems like the traffic is just solid now. Now, I know the Y brought a lot of traffic, but is there something that can be timed different, or it's not a matter of timing? What is it? The wow. traffic lights from County Line Road down to Large Road are not uh, intermingled. They, they're, they're not synced together. They would, they would have to be linked, uh, and that's a, a huge uh, a project that we're not involved in. One of the things that we, um, we actually just recently did, it's actually not even submitted yet, um, working with Mr. Pannoni, our township engineer, and we're submitting a, an, what they call an hourly grant. It's a grant that goes to, to PennDOT. Uh, we were um, very blessed... Uh, last year, we're hoping that we're going to get it established late 2017. Realistically, it's probably going to be 2018. It's an enormous project. It's a um, traffic adaptive system. We got a very similar grant. We did uh, Township Line in Westchester Pike, uh, Darby in Westchester Pike, and Lansdowne in Darby. That uh, triangle. It's a very challenging intersection, and the, and it is timed and it's also camera control. And it's been a, an enormous success. We applied for that same um, CMAC grant uh, to do from Westchester Pike there and Darby Road, the entire 
um, length of Westchester Pike to the borderline in uh, at 476, and we were we were lucky. We got the grant. It's just shy of a $700,000 grant. It will still cost the taxpayers us um, probably another $300,000. It's going to be a million dollar um, project, but it's going to be an enormous. The second part of this initiative that we applied for, I was just telling you about, is this Arley grant, and that's going to link uh, fiber optic. We would go from Eagle Road all the way to Darby Road. Right now, there's no way for us to do any timing um, for those traffic intersections along Eagle Road until we get those uh, fiber optic lines put in. We, we are optimistic that we will get the grant. If we do, again, it will probably be a late 2017, early 2018 initiative. So that's our uh, ultimate goal. Laura, aren't the two new traffic lights here at the Y and Lawrence linked together now? Yeah, they, they have, the lights were not linked until they redid the intersection at Lawrence and From, from the Y and Lawrence and Eagles. So yeah. those lights now are linked together. Yeah. So they don't work against each other. It's volume is what it is. It's just so much volume <laughs> needed road, just there's nowhere to go. Yeah, and I if I could add, I know there's a perception and it, let's let's face it, I mean the Y has brought a lot of uh, positive things to the community. Uh, but one of the things that I've worked very closely with our police department and uh, we have done some aerial um, studies for traffic control and in the morning when the uh, the traffic is the worst in the evening when the traffic is worst um uh, the ymca if you look at aerial uh, footage ymca's parking lot is less than halfway full so the traffic is not going in and out of the y the y is not creating um the traffic dilemma on eagle road uh, and that that that's a that's a fact you know how I work, John goes back um, 45, 45 years. I, I started uh, in, in public safety in 1978. So I've been responding to calls like uh, the, the police officers uh, for a number of years in Hartford Township. Hartford Township is a cut through community. Um, when the Blue Route came in, it's been a positive thing, but my perspective, not for Hartford Township. You, you got cut through traffic. When I, when I leave um, to go to work from here, to go home to Westgate, it takes me 20 minutes to get from here to, to West, uh, just on the other side of Manoa Shopping Center. And when I worked part-time at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania, I can get down to Penn faster than I can get to my house. It's just, it, it, it's, it's, you know, our community is, is a, a, it's a challenge. It's, um, but it, I, 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 you got, I try, I like to create the, the cor correct the perception. Um, the why is not created the, the traffic problem on Eagle Road. Well, I will From Lawrence to Grassland could hit 50 miles an hour, and yeah. then you were really dead. Now it's a, they can really only hit about 28. Well, even with the <laughs> even with the uh, the the the, uh, the Pico uh, nightmare that they've been through, and it's not all Pico's fault. But uh, again, you know, it's not our road. We can we can only work uh, as close as uh, with PennDOT. They they call the shots. The good news is we found out late uh, yesterday that the uh, the work to repave. One half of Eagle Road will, is supposed to start this evening. So when I leave here tonight, when we leave here tonight, we'll we'll see if they're there salt cutting and there's flagmen, and and we're optimistic that uh, that should be done, um, uh, weather permitting, by the end of the, uh, the month. It's usually about a two to three week process. Uh, and again, unfortunately, we pleaded, we begged, and I'm, I'm sorry to tie you guys up, but we pleaded and begged and did everything we could. I threatened um, uh, er every took every angle we possibly could, had PennDOT and, and Pico here in the room, and uh, they would not, it's just, it just, it's mind boggling that PennDOT would not complete that section and do all of it. So what Pico is gonna be doing is doing 50% uh, uh, of the roadway, and I'm told again late yesterday that uh, from probably the 7-Eleven down to the YMCA, that will be curb to curb. Uh, I don't know why. I guess it's the way they did some cuts. Um, the bad news is it, the, we'll start from Darby Road all the way down to close to St. Dennis. Uh, that's going to be in the upcoming months. So once that's done. June 16th. Yeah, no, they're going to start. Yeah, unfortunately. 
And no matter where you go in Havertown, you either have Aqua or Pico working. It's it's just a challenge. And it's not just Havertown. Yeah, it's a, we have old gas lines and old water pipes. Yeah. The infrastructure. And we're doing the same thing. We try what we do. Uh, with the township as we have uh, quarterly meetings with Aqua, P uh, Pico, and PennDOT and Township Public Works where we go over uh, and we issue on our roads. We can issue permits um, only on our roads. We do a road program usually every two years. We give them what the roads are we're going to do so we're not uh, crossing paths. It's gotten better, but it's uh, the coordination between uh, Pico and Aqua and PennDOT need to improve dramatically. So. I'm sorry I didn't tie you guys up. Any other questions for the why? Otherwise, I'd like to let them leave and thank them. This is, I think, the third year now we've done this. I started this with Commissioner Hall. Um, and the number of questions has diminished, so that's, a, I think, a good sign. Thank you. Thank you. If, if we could, we'll open it up now to questions, and I see a hand in the back corner. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask about what we were just uh, talking about there with like, the traffic lights. Um, is it possible to also link the light at Eagle and Darby? Um, because as, um, as the work like, hasn't been done, to move the, move the uh, uh, traffic like away from the Y, then it gets down the Eagle and Darby, and it can uh, uh, bottleneck there. And then uh, Ralston like becomes like a uh, like a bleeder valve, like let off like traffic, and like uh, that can be calm. Mm -hmm. So is it possible you to link that with why also? Or uh, what you also mentioned about like a grant, something along uh, uh, Darby Road, you know? Because I think that becomes sort of like a bottleneck there as like the uh, traffic is uh, moved away from the wide uh, better and better people. Well, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Once. I'll, oh, I'll you try to get yeah. the, the the first thing to do is we're, we if we do get the RLE grant, uh, we will link uh, from uh, Eagle Road from Darby Road all the way to Westchester Pike. It'll be a fiber optic, and then they will communicate. Each of the lights will communicate. We can do it right at the box locations at the at the actual. Um, uh, street light itself, or the, the traffic uh, light itself, and as well as through the police department's computer system where timing goes off, they can manipulate it. Uh, if the grant doesn't go through, we then can work with the police department to do, do timing uh, controls where it's not going to fix the, the, the problem, but it may help. Uh, as far as Darby Road, we've actually uh, been looking at that, and that's probably a little bit lower on the priority list. Because the Eagle, Eagle Road and Westchester Pike are our two main objectives that we need to get accomplished right now. The good news is we, we, we will see benefit for Westchester Pike um, in the very near future. Hopefully, um, my goal was to be you know, sometime uh, the first quarter of 2018 for them to be installed and operational. The other good news about that is Marple Township, part of the construction that's going on there, uh, right by the uh, 476 interchange, that developer has to commit, I believe, uh, close to a million dollars in traffic improvement, and they're going to put the same traffic adaptive lighting system from New Ardmore to Pike down to the Havertown border. So that may uh, make some benefits. And there was a substantial state grant for that project to reconstruct the interchange at the Blue Route, including Lawrence Road, uh, and they haven't made the final plans. I've talked to Township Engineer about it, and they don't have the final plans, and they're waiting for the details of the grant, but that will help. It's not going to alleviate the problems, but it will help the bottleneck at Lawrence and, West, and Westchester Pike that is a nightmare in the mornings. But it, it's a question of volume. Um, Eagle Road gets 31,000 cars a day. Darby only gets 24,000. So, you know, and Darby's twice as wide. So, you know, there's no place for all those cars to go. Yeah, but it's the uh, just to be clear, like, I'm just well, about we are the only, yeah. Uh, Darby, like I'm concerned about like Eagles, because I think that 
probably creates a backup and then like spill over, right? The customers, like as you said. So I am concerned about you with not as much about uh, dark. Thank you. Just, just so everyone knows what the, the traffic adapted, just because we've talked about it a couple things, but not, probably not everyone was there. The, the simplest explanation I've gotten for it is, um, you know, if you go to a, if you, if you go to a game uh, in South Philadelphia, if you go to a Villanova basketball game on Lancaster Avenue, and there's a cop sitting on the corner, and that cop is controlling the light. Essentially, these cameras have sensors, and they look out into to the intersection, and they count the number of cars that are there. So it's not a set timer like we're used to. It's, it's interactive. The cameras look and they say if there's cars coming down one way, that light should be green. So that light could be green for 15 minutes. If it, I mean, not that it ever would be for 15 right, minutes. Right, right. But essentially, it's an interactive through the cameras. It, it's essentially the equivalent of a cop standing on the corner the whole time pushing the button, saying, "Up, oh, that needs the green light now. This needs the green light more." Um, and that, you know, if we if we eventually get these grants. That will go, you know, it's not going to solve Eagle Road's problem. Like, Eagle Road's problem is volume, but it will go a long way to, to sort of helping some of our problems in terms of cut through traffic and, and some of the backups at, at rush hour. You know, and the other thing, uh, uh, again, that's going to happen. Westchester Pike will happen, and I failed to mention, but we all know that College Avenue is shut down right now. It's yeah, detoured yeah. because they're doing the bridge. And PennDOT was committed, so when they redo the bridge and it's reopened, at Haverford and College will be that new traffic light with the traffic adaptive. Then the bad news is they're going to sh shut down Ardmore Avenue. Uh, Open up College Avenue, but when that project's done, that light will be uh, traffic adapted. So we're we're seeing a lot of progress that's happening. Just wish it could dump, come a little bit faster, but um, we're making some good um, just some good just motion. To, to jump on that, since it was brought up um, for for the people in the third ward that are here, um, we we are going to have we had we had an event at Cooperstown before the College Avenue bridge construction started uh, with Commissioner Lewis and myself. And we'll have an event in the fall before the Ardmore Bridge construction starts, and then we'll have another event after, a couple months after to sort of just, uh, we'll have PennDOT officials there, because PennDOT's the one doing the problems, and that way uh, the residents will be able to voice their concerns, and, and we'll give that opportunity. Um, but we'll set that up for sometime in the fall before the project starts. And we've had no... John? No, yeah. we have a College Avenue, the College Avenue Bridge, I mean, I think there was a lot of concern initially about detours. And, and the good thing is the bridges from my understanding with PennDOT, are, are, are very similar. So we're hoping that any kinks in the project uh, will be worked out during the College Avenue Bridge so that when they do the Ardmore Avenue Bridge, it, it should be hopefully smooth sailing. Um, and, and the benefit, we, we, we talk about cut, cut through traffic at, at all these meetings. The, the benefit of when the Ardmore Avenue Bridge is under construction is that there'll be a lot less incentive to cut through um, the Merwood Park and the Ardmore Gulf and that manner. Right, yeah. <laughs> because the bridge won't be there to go to. There's no core to cut through. <laughs> I was going to ask you, have they looked at the Eagle Road Bridge? Which? Uh, uh, Pendle. I, I don't know. That's the one, the one at, uh, that hits Hereford? That, yeah. that, that was redone. That was redone yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 a new, that's a new bridge. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask a question. two thank yous and two requests. Um, I'm a firm believer in LED lights, and the, my LED street lights went in today. Looking forward to them when I get home. And talk to your public works people. Uh, not to use my normal vernacular, uh, the last snowstorm we had was challenging. And they did a heck of a job. I traveled through a lot of communities, and really, the Public Works guys did a, a really nice job on, those, on that plowing job. The only two requests I have is Cooperstown Road, as you're coming southeast, approaching Darby. Right in that challenge. It widens out to two lanes, so that people can take the left and people can take the right. But there's no lane delineator. Very many people drive down there. They want to square their car up so they're at a 90 degree angle to Darby Road, even though the roadway isn't. When they do that, they pull into the right hand lane so that those who want to take a right hand turn can't. I wonder if we could get a line there. We, perfect timing because we're actually. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm meeting with, with some members of PennDOT, with some of the other commissioners, township officials on Thursday, and, and we can ask. The second one is just uh, Penn Road at, in front of the Acme. You've got the left lane is the straight through lane, and the right lane is right lane only. When somebody wants to turn left out of the straight lane, you're not allowed to go to the right to go around them because that's a right turn only lane. 
They, I wonder if we could change that setup. On the Acme side or, or the pen? Uh, on the Acme side. Right at the, right at the entrance to Havertown. Right at the entrance to Havertown. We'll that's an easy one. That's ours. So we can, we'll look at that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other? I'm not checking my phone. I'm just going to write down the <laughs> yes, uh, Bob Martin, uh, 109 Terra Alta Circle. First of all, uh, thanks to uh, Manager Gentilly. We had a tree down on Darby Creek Road. I called him about it. He was out there within the hour with a public works official. It was cleared off. It was hanging on a power line, and it would have knocked out the power to the neighborhood. So thank you. Uh, my question to the uh, two commissioners is uh, the... Uh, Delaware County Common Police Court has ordered a countywide reassessment uh, to take effect in 2021. I would ask what uh, you feel the impact is going to be on the third and fourth wards, and what will you be doing in terms of public awareness to let people know that in great likelihood uh, their property uh, assessments will go up and likewise their property taxes. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, my, my, I mean, this, this, so, so for those that don't know, um, there were two lawsuits that were filed against the county, essentially saying that the, the way the taxes are uh, set up on the county level in terms of what your, your millage is for your house, what the assessment is, which is how the number that you get in terms of what you actually pay is judged, um, was... Uh, essentially, they were they were arguing it was unconstitutional, um, and the, the the common pleas court, as uh, you just indicated, in directed that there will be a reassessment from the county level um, by twenty twenty one, I believe. Well, they're gonna carry I, it's going to start in twenty. It's going to start in, 20, gonna it's gonna start in twenty eighteen, yeah. um, and then it'll take effect. You know, from everything I've read so far, um, it's probably not going to be great for Havertown, and we're going to have to, you know, we're, there's going to have to be some public discussion about it and there you know we'll push the county to have public forums where, where voices can be heard um, but I'm reluctant to say exactly what will be the impact because at this point it's, it's sort of speculation on the part of um, a reporter or somebody assuming what the assessment will be because the county at to this point at least not, not to my knowledge the county hasn't released any information about uh, exactly how the assessment is going to take place um, you know, it's, it's not an assessment that will be done on the township level, so we won't be preparing to sort of conduct the assessment. Um, you know, I, I know it's something that every township in Delaware County um, is going to be interested in and is waiting for information from the county. And I, and I think the appropriate reaction um, would be to get that information from the county, um, disperse it to the public, and then uh, take proper course to, to have it discussed. Yeah, I think if you have house inspections, of every property, that's going to have a big impact. Or if you have flyover inspections, which they're saying that they can do with the existing records, that won't have the personal impact, but then people are likely to say, well, how can you tell me what my house is valued at when you're... Right. And so, so that's part, part of the issue is we have to find out how they're actually going to do it, because, you know, at, at this point, like you said, there's, there's a couple different ways, there, there's processes that different areas have used to, to reassess. Um, so we have to know what, what they're going to do first um, and, and then react. Uh, but, you know, what, what I think we could do at the township level is, is make sure the public is kept up to speed so that when we get information from the county, we disperse it um, and also make, you know, the public aware of, of what their appeal rights are. So when, you know, Philadelphia just did a, a massive reassessment for everybody, uh, every resident there, and, you know, there's a certain appeal process where if you don't appreciate your assessment, you can, you can appeal Having a meeting with the county here would be helpful. And you'd need to go to a high school or a touring or something. Because if you we'd, probably, people, we'd probably need the football field. Yeah. <laughs> Eight but still, you can come on Monday. But, but so, 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 I mean, I, I think, I think those are all great ideas, but at, the, at this point, we don't have a ton right. of information other than the fact that the, the court ordered the reassessment. Right. That, that's, all, that's, all, that's the only certain thing right now. We can, we can have certain assumptions as to what's going to happen. Um, with that reassessment, but it, it is just yeah. an assumption. But let me, to just add, and we don't have enough information right now to let people know. Uh, what you do have to know is that one of the two lawsuits arose from the reserve, um, where the residents there had been 
concerned, to say the least, about the, their assessments uh, not being consistent with others. So in the fourth ward, it's, it, it will have some mixed bag. There are going to be people who will go up. We can assume people in the reserve will probably go down. Uh, but we don't know enough. All I can tell you is, for those who are at least in the fourth ward or who, who, who know me or communicate with me, I will assure you that you will get all the information that I have when I have it, both through emails, through my website, and whatever other means, because we all need to know the information. Right now, we don't know much. Um, you know, I know Judge Burr ordered it, but I, until the, town, the county determines the implementation process, it's just too soon. But there was a comment. No, you didn't answer oh, okay. <coughs> but I, 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 the, the thing that we can say that I, I think Commissioner Siegel would, would echo is that, you know, I, I consider the, the main part of our job, there's lots of other parts of our job, but the main part of our job is to make sure that your, your, your property taxes um, on a township level are sort of equivalent with what your, your house value would be. Um, so from that perspective, anything that happens with this reassessment, I think it's going to be something that we're going to have to do everything humanly possible to make sure everybody in this township is aware of. Uh, because I think it is you know, crucial to everybody who lives in the township. Other questions? Okay. I, I live on Woodcroft Road, and um, coming down Darby, there's, uh, there's over about 30, we have almost 30 children under 12 and under on our street. Kids are on bikes, kids are walking, kids are running, and I have four myself, and I can't even tell you how many cars come flying down that road. Um, so I wasn't sure if there was a, uh, you know, we get one of those digital signs that tells you how fast you're going, uh, or a do not enter local traffic only, three to six. Well, we, we can't regulate the traffic off of the state road. And it, right. It's not enforceable for us. Uh, at Commissioner's request, we did a traffic study, and we just finished it last week up there. So if anybody saw that black box, we were counting cars at counts of speeds, uh, volume, times of day, and percentages, and it just, it's, it's all encompassing what we do. Deputy Chief Hagel, will share that with you now, and then we'll, we'll talk more okay. about it. Thank you. Uh, we did the study up on, on Woodcroft, and what we found was the average speed was 26 miles per hour which is the speed limit is 25 on this street. The average amount of cars per day were 286 cars per day. So that, that gets broken down into percentages of what the vehicles are actually doing the speed. The majority of the vehicles are doing uh, 15 miles per hour, 1,389 over the course of the study, and then at 20 miles per hour is the next speed at 1,200, and then 788 are actually doing the speed limit. So the majority are doing under speed limit. You do have 24 cars that did 35 miles per hour, and there was 213 cars over the course of the week that did 30 miles per hour. So the majority of the cars are actually going under the speed limit on that street. We're only allowed to, um, it's a secret that we don't like to tell, but we can only do enforcement for 10 miles over speed limit. So somebody would have to be doing 35 miles per hour for us to write a traffic citation there because we're not allowed to use radar. We're only allowed to use timing devices, which the state says we then have to give people 10 miles per hour. So um, in order to even do enforcement on the street, it would be uh, severely low. We could probably not even get that many tickets uh, written up in there. It's actually 2.8% is what they said would be of all the cars coming down the street the 2.8 percent would we would only be able to do the enforcement on it but we we can put that speed sign up we to speed that. trailer we can put that up there that, that puts gives the speed out now when we do get that up there it doesn't flash every car and only we we set it for cars going over the speed limit and it'll start flashing that to that way it re, uh, preserves the battery otherwise it'll be dead in the day so when it goes up there you think it's not working because you're doing the speed limit so anybody going over the speed limit uh, it will flash so we will get it up there thank you there are some streets off of Darby though that Woodcroft is on that do have signs up that say local traffic only. Uh, I'll explain that to you. Local that. traffic only signs are unenforceable. They mean nothing. They are signs that just are signs. Right. What we have right. tried to do uh, with the commissioners over the past five or six years is to try and get our signs under control. Uh, people get very used to, I want a sign. We put it up, but it means nothing. If the police can't enforce it, everybody's under perception that, you know, why aren't the police doing their job? The speed limit says 15, and in fact, it really is 25. So when you put a sign up, local traffic only, it, it's just that sign. It doesn't do anything. It just takes up space. And you drive around town and look at the amount of signs we have. It's 
astronomical. And the cost is astronomical so nowadays. Yeah. What the sides we try and put it now are sides that are enforceable, and we always have a discussion, and the commissioners always come to us and ask us to do surveys. So it's not just like, would you put a sign up here for me? We give them an answer if we think it's, it's doable and it's enforceable. So there is some control with what we do. So that way when you say, look, you know, we have this sign up here and it's this, then we can then enforce it. So what you see are signs that are probably 30 years old. We don't take them down, but they, they're totally unenforceable for the police department. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and the Woodcroft was a result of a resident who requested it. We've done it on Tyson recently. We've done it in a number of areas, and I'm sure the same in the third ward. But when people ask, you know, we'll have the police. They get the information. You had a question over here? I'm in the third ward, Katie Thompson. I'd like to thank you for your presence on West Hathaway because it really has changed people's behavior down sort of the cut through and the stop signs. Welcome. It may not last, but it certainly well, has we changed people's behavior. Well, we move around because we get a lot of, a lot of uh, requests. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my other question is, though, along the same lines as sort of the traffic study, when you sort of think about sort of the um, acceleration to get to 25 miles an hour just on a one block street, sort of how does that play a, a part of it? Because when I think about sort of block to block, getting up to 25, particularly with young children, um, you know, does that play a part of it, sort of thinking of the physics of it, or is it just sort of purely the numbers? But, go ahead, the, for, in order for, the state regulates what we can actually put onto a street, and the minimum technically, unless it's a school zone, is 15 is a school zone. Everything else has to be 25 miles per hour or 35 miles per hour if the road can handle that. Um, the majority of residential streets, you'll see that they are 25 miles per hour. Um, a lot, there's a lot of signs that predate um, when we took over the traffic control, which they all say 15, 20. There's like all these different signs out there. They're not enforceable by us. And they're, they're a feel-good sign. People see that. Um, we hope that they would do the 15, but we can't go out and actually do enforcement on the street. So, but most streets are designed to be 25 miles per hour. And any street that's not posted is 25 miles an hour by state wall. And, sure. and My just, comment was just though, so the amount of scale, acceleration to get to 25 miles per hour between two stop signs is pretty fast. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 the acceleration from, from point A to point B. Sure, sure. Understood. Absolutely. Or, Lawrence Road uh, between Howard and Chester. Um, down that rabbit hole, there's a large vacant building. What's going to happen to that building? Yes. Yeah, right behind yeah. 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 We, 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 we all know, know the building. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, well, we see it really. You know, it's it's actually looking better now because all the trees are down. Now you can see the building. The building is uh, owned by the property owner who owns um, Direct Paint and Collision. So the 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 gentleman who operates that auto repair uh, business in the back bought the property. I have been waiting for plans to come in for about six weeks. I've, I've spoken with his attorney about it and he said we're not quite sure where we're going yet. They have a number of issues to develop the site. The first is obviously there's a grade issue. So there's access limitations <coughs> And the second is that the rear portion of the lot is actually part of the CAP Superfund site. So there's going to be some constraints on what can be built where because you can't put certain things on that. Also, there's um, a drainage easement that runs. Uh, the stormwater is collected um, when the EPA capped the, the site and they added fill on top of it so that the site could be reused, which is where the Mr. Storage is now. It's on top of the CAP. Um, they actually took the water and ran it around and it goes through that property. There's actually a big pipe back there. And it's supposed to run out to the, there's a stormwater retention pit next to the treatment plant between the treatment plant and, and the new building, the new Mr. Storage. But it doesn't actually ever get there. It's, it, there, it lays there a lot. So they're going to have to adjust the grades and maybe even that pipe to get positive flow or create a separate retention facility, which means they have to get approval from the EPA and DEP to do that because of its impact on the Superfund site. So we'll be done eventually, right? The property it's owner not be easy. Yeah, is aware, <laughs> but understand historically, that was the original location for Mr. Storage. 
and the planning commission had given approval, I think the zoning board may have too, but they had so many complications with the EPA, they finally decided to well, place there's it elsewhere. A red flag about vapor intrusion, intrusion. at the time. So, um, and they were doing some testing, and uh, the, the developer just couldn't get yeah. financing yeah. with that so, hanging over. So. Unfortunately, the trees blocked a lot of that view. Yeah. No. People coming down and look at, say, what is this, Havertown? How could it be? I know, but let, let me tell you, there are, there are a couple of hazards that have been mitigated, yeah. and the inside of the building was almost mm -hmm. unpassable. It truly was a fire hazard. So yeah, yeah. there have been... Yeah. It, it just even though it's more visible now, there's been a lot done to sort of clean that up um, in preparation of development. And it took about two and a half years to get through the process with the YMCA because we were dealing with the EPA and there were, and the township bought the pro took the property by eminent domain. So we took the property. There were liability uh, agreements that had to be worked out with the environmental agencies. So it's a long process when you get involved in. Do, do they intend to rehab or replace the building? They're considering both, I think. They were. I think that they're afraid to uh, replace the building. I think they're afraid of because the it's not conforming. Would be too difficult, so they're going to rehab the building. That that was the last I heard from them. But it's not conforming with respect to the setbacks. Um, they don't have improved parking. There's a number of issues. So. I would imagine they're going to look to see what's going to cause the least bloodletting, you know? It's, thank you. That's, it's a tough area. Um, if you, but, you know, all I could say is I hope, you know, I'm not a patient person by nature, but if you look at where that whole corner has been and the, the, the bubblegum factory and everything and where we are now, if that portion gets rehabbed, and I believe it will because the owner cares about the community, he's been here for many years. I think you'll see a big difference, and it, at least now it doesn't look like a place where you're going to find a dead body right. in between the, uh, right. the bushes. <laughs> but it always looks like it's from a horror movie and, to me. And just to add to that quarter, um, Swiss, Swiss Farms, because of the, the storm damage last year, is also going to renovate that area, um, and there'll be streetscape improvements once they, once they do their renovation. They're, they're so the, the, the streetscape improvements on, on both sides from you know, where the 7-Eleven is and Young Produce all the way to Lawrence Road is going to be redone and it's going to, you know, it's going to look nice and it's going to be, it's going to be sort of the, the steps that we've talked about before of sort of pushing, pushing down from where the Y is and from where uh, the Wawa is and sort of pushing into the rest of the businesses on Eagle Road to sort of step up their right. game in terms of streetscape. You look at the new building that's being built yeah. where the two old houses were taken down, you see that the streetscape has been, is being installed and the goal would be to eventually have all of Eagle Road look like that, but unfortunately we it's have time. to be patient. It's, it's <laughs> Very patient. But it's a big difference from, you know, Not what it was. Yeah. Yeah. from what that area was. Now it's turning into a gateway that we have one end of the Oakmont Business District that looks very nice. And now you come in and you see the Y and you're starting to see the streetscape and you're not just seeing an empty field or you know, all of that, so it's getting there, but you know, we all want it sooner. Brandon? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that, man. For being around for a while, I mean, I just when a long time ago there was a lot of discussion what to do with Eagle Road and doing one big shared parking lot, and we learned a lot of lessons there. But um, I think with a lot of leadership from uh, Lori and Larry and the township, uh, they really listened and they really did great two gateway communities. And, they really thought this through, but why having to conform to the streetlights and uh, also up at Eagle Road with the Lori being able to get a grant for uh, switching the lights to LED there to put all those new lights that are now much more, you know, they're not like 70s eye pollution lights. They're, they're, they're like, they look nice, you could put hanging baskets on them, you could plug uh, seasonal lights and go. And, you know, you can start to see businesses, you know, although it, they don't, I know it's a recommendation to follow the design pattern. It doesn't actually have enforcement, but what I admire about the commissioners is they're, they're getting these businesses to really, you know, do everything they can to follow the, uh, the, met the methodology for using the, the updated street lights that we want to do. And there's, you know, so that new building is a perfect example. If, if, if more businesses look to rehab, they're going to really be pushed to follow that 
that streetscape out and conform to this master plan. So um, I think that's a very positive. Thank you. Other questions? The uh, scariest thing I've ever seen for pedestrians in town is Lawrence Road and Westchester Pike. And with the redesign, uh, I am cer fairly certain PennDOT is not going to care about that. So the question is, you know, this is really probably the last opportunity for a good long while to I do anything. They redesigned. PennDOT has, has to deal with them, am I correct? Once, once they start working on a road, uh, the pedestrian is part of that, am I correct, Lord? Uh, yes. they, they have to upgrade that. So where there's no crosswalks and no sidewalks, does that suggest that they're going to consider that? Well, it's a, there's a public transportation route right there. And yes. Creating an accessible route to the bus stop and everything, when they do that, now, neither of those are township roads. So we sort of get it at the end when somebody's already put a concept together and then they present it to us. But um, I think if I think if somebody could put a bug in their ear before they design, once you design stuff, yeah. <laughs> Peter, when, when PennDOT usually does something like that, we, we do have some input. We have asked for changes in the past, and they, uh, they have been done. So yeah, I, I don't walk it. I drive it. But it really scares me when I see people in walking in the street, including in inclement weather. Um, it's a bad place. Yeah, a uh, little bit different question. I was I was interested in how what percentage of the budget currently goes to uh, funding pension pension plans, and do you envision that increasing over the next few years? Uh, I don't believe so. No, we actually uh, a number of years ago that we uh, eliminated the defined pension program um, for the township, and we we do a four hundred one now for all new employees. So those employees are were um, um, grandfathered in, so that's been about five, six years now, I believe. So uh, the it's still in the. Uh, uh, we're actually working on the uh, new four-year contract for the non-uniform employees. All the employees are paying more into the into the pension program, so uh, we don't anticipate uh, it going up much more than what we're doing now. So the people that are in the traditional plan, they're contributing more. That point? That's correct. Every year goes up. Now, again, we're this the 2017 will be the last year of this contract, so we're currently negotiating uh, the next four years for them. Because I know it's been uh, at least reported to be a major challenge at the state level. It is a major challenge. The good the good news is that uh, um, we you know one of the things that I've done uh, and been blessed that surrounded myself with uh, with uh, talented people. And we brought in a shining star who's actually turned this township around financially. Um, seven to ten years ago, uh, we pretty much, uh, not just myself, but the Board of Commissioners, we inherited a lot of nightmares. Uh, township had almost zero money in the general fund reserve. We had no policy procedures uh, from prior administrations where um, it pre prevented the commissioners from utilizing fund reserve to offset taxes and to do the right things. We, uh, we were almost delinquent on our bonds because we didn't have any audits. Uh, I can go on and on about all the nightmares that we had, but we brought in um, Amy uh, Cuthbertson, who's actually sitting in the audience. She wanted to na be named Amy. Would you please stand? And... Uh, <laughs> And I, I'm happy to report that uh, the township financially is better today than it's ever been. Uh, and, and I mean that with all sincerity, and that's because of Amy's leadership and, and the support of the Board of Commissioners. We have um, a, a, a very stable fund balance. Our, our pension plans for the uniform and non-uniform were in a, uh, Amy, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, almost in a critical state, and we're moving up. Uh, the funding is, as a, uh, we're just about there. We don't do uh, smoothing anymore. Um, so we're doing all the right things. The township um, is, uh, is doing all the, all the great things as far as making us a more financial stable uh, community. Um, so yes, thank you for your question. When I became a commissioner, we didn't have audits done for many years. Now the audits move smoothly, and the township runs financially so much. It's not even like you can't even compare what it was, um, and that's because we have professionals who oversee it. 
the pension plans were in significant you know financial issues that's that's improved dramatically and the board they started I guess about 10 years ago sh shortly before I became a commissioner eliminated smoothing which is essentially kick the, the it costs down the road and you then pay for it later double sort of if you don't pay your credit card and only pay the interest you're gonna pay more and we've eliminated all of that and been very proactive yeah. And in, uh, we, I, mean, I know a lot of times when you get those newsletters, uh, uh, you know, Amy and, and Lori do most of the uh, reporting in there, uh, but there's some, a lot of good information. And we also, every year, Amy and myself, will do a mid-year budget report to see where we are operationally, uh, report any variances, positive or negative, and how we're going to address them. Uh, a good thing this year is because we had a mild winter, so we, we do have some um, monies that will help us offset any any uh, variances and the biggest challenge is again that we you know you can you can you can plan um and forecast how you're going to operate your departments day to day but again for for an enormous uh, size community you never know as far as some unexpected you're going to have one sanitary break that could cost us over three hundred thousand dollars now we have emergency contingencies to address that uh, but if we don't use a lot utilize that money going to always be set aside for infrastructure improvements and it's the other thing that the this township has done i can tell you in the 10 years that i've been here with the the elected commissioners and the, my administrative staff that work with me we've done more infrastructure improvements um than the history of this township in the past 10 years we've done more road improvements a uh, road restoration um, in, in 10 years than the township's done in 35 years. These are all factual things. Things were needed. We're the fifth largest uh, first place township in the Commonwealth. That's another thing. It's a large, large community. We have 18,000 households in a small compact area and the township is growing. That's a good thing. Our census is actually starting to go back up again. So, um, uh, all good stuff's happening. And, uh, you know, obviously we have, uh, I'm sure, uh, Dan and Kevin are going to talk, mention a little bit about the new municipal uh, services building and the, and the future improvements of the library. These are all needed things that were put off way, way too long and they're going to be occurring over the next uh, two years. Um, those who utilize the Oakmont um, municipal lot and the Brookline municipal lot, we've invested. Uh, we're hoping within two to three weeks we'll have a new parking kiosk um, we're going to put the one in Oakmont Municipal Lot. That's going to go up first. Uh, when that's done, we'll reseal and restripe the lines. Uh, it'll be able to use uh, cash, change, credit card, and probably once it's up and running, we um, uh, get it up and running and everything's problematic, uh, problem-free, you'll be able to use your smartphone and pay uh, with that kiosk as well. And then we'll put the one down at the Brookline parking lot. So we're doing all the right things. We're working really good with uh, now our partners with the HPED and trying to make uh, Havertown a more pleasant, a pleasing uh, community when you drive in our, our medial strips, making sure they're clean and flower gardens. And I, uh, we have a pretty strict sign ordinance. I've been... Uh, <laughs> we, we're anti-sign in right away. And, and I have... Upper Darby and Marple asking me how are we doing it, and because it's everybody's job. So, um. just to just to follow up on that a little bit, um, you know, I mean, we we've been talking about uh, you know all the, the streetscape improvements and everything that we're doing uh, to sort of develop business development within within our town. On, on we have we have multiple sort of main street areas uh, in the town in terms of shopping districts and, and areas, but we. We have a limited number of, of houses, and we don't. We're not Chester County. We're, we're not. There's no more space. We're not building any more houses. So you know, looking, what, what we're trying to look at is you know down the road, 15, 20 years from now, it, it benefits all of us if, if the business community in this township um, can grow and increase and increase the, the tax revenue base that we get from the businesses. Simply because there's there's no there's not going to be more houses. You know that the house the housing tax base that we have in this township is. is is going to the, the number of, of, tax, of houses is going to stay the same. So the only area for growth that we have in the township is, is to sort of spur this this business development uh, that's occurring in town. So that that's why the township is, is partnering with the HBT. That's why the township is uh, taking taking funds from the budget to support streetscape improvements, and that, that's why we're doing things like that. So, you know, it's really to benefit us in the long term planning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I guess I have a question slash comment. Um, oh, that makes it easier. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I've been in Havertown for about eight years now, and just a uh, random thing, uh, I, I was throwing out a grill last week, uh, and uh, I was told by the trash guy, oh, we don't take that. And I'm like, we don't take it. He's like, oh, we don't take it. You have to call the township. So I called the township, and the gentleman says uh, there's a bulk trash collection there, which I didn't know what that was. And so he explains that you know you have to pay a certain fee. And he went on, and I fell asleep, and I woke back up, and he then explains that there's all there's, there's, there's this whole process. But he says if it's not bulk, then we'll take it. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? He's like, if you break it down, we'll take it. I'm like. Okay, so I get a new grill on Thursday. I put it together. I proceed to get my drill and break, break apart the old grill. An hour later, I'm wondering, why am I doing all this when we, I pay so much in taxes that you would just think once in a blue moon. I'm not saying, like, I should be able to throw out a sofa every month or whatever, but, you know, once a year if I have a little coupon or something to throw out something big, you, you would think it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But, I mean, I spent, like, an hour breaking this thing apart. And then, sure enough, they came today, and they, it was all bagged up, and it took a bit. I'm like, wow, like, why am I... Why am I doing this? Like, what, what am I doing? Here? I would love nothing more to pick up bulk pickup, but it, it, is a, it becomes a financial nightmare because you need a specific type of vehicle. Um, when you start talking about bulk, then you have hazardous waste disposal, uh, and that's the majority of that bulk pickup, those items, can't go to the, to the county's trash incinerary plant. Um, and that's why we came up with the best possible scenario for those uh, and not every employee and uh, not every resident is going to use it. in fact very minimal amount of the percentage of residents in the community use it so why would we want to impact the entire um, uh, township tax base uh, let me touch on one other thing before I continue to go on uh, I know it's a it's a always thing that I try to get out there when you look at your tax bill when you get it in people like myself you have a nightmare 18% of that number, just remember, eight, only 18% of that total number is your Haverford Township tax. I can't, I don't, we don't control what the school board does. We don't control what the county does. But only 18% of your total bill is what you, you pay for your, um, your township services, your police, your fire, your emergency medical services, and a highway and the tree department, only 18% of that number. So please remember that when you, when you see you pay, we all pay a large number of money it's, it's, it's very small in comparison but to give you an idea we if we would want to get into the bulk business we'd actually have to buy two specific vehicles and hire four uh, full-time employees to manage to do that amount of work where uh, it's it's more uh, cost effective and we believe we can provide a better service by contracting an outside service and we do that once a week well the gentleman I spoke with said though that he was saying something about how there you guys only get about 50 bulk items a year or something, he said, and he's like, 10 of those are grills, so grills are definitely a bulk item. So I was just scratching my Actually, head, that's, like, that's incorrect. I mean, we, we, they, they, the, 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 the company comes every Wednesday. They do Wednesdays. They'll work from morning until night until they get it off. The majority of them are dishwashers, washing machines, um, those with any kind of Freon. They have to be, uh, they have to have special uh, equipment to dismantle that, dispose of it. Um, it, and again, it wouldn't be able to, to, to go to the county site. And the other, one of the other success stories that I like to talk about is um, 10 years ago when we all started, uh, our trash fee used to be free. Um, then the county came up with a disposal fee. That, our trash fee, when they hit that, was a million dollars a year for the residents of this township. Actually, the exact number was $998,000. And we did two initiatives. We researched very quickly how we can improve our recycling program, and we used to do um, pick up <coughs> by item. Pick up glass one day, and so we implemented the single stream recycling. We did that, and we implemented um, brush. Um, brush. Uh, yard waste, and we're in one of the only towns, um, I think, besides Radnor that does it, but the only only town that does weekly curbside, um, and we were able to dra drop our trash disposal fee, and it's pretty much plateaued. We pay about five hundred fifty thousand, mm -hmm. about right, Amy, about five hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. So we did a significant um, improvement to reduce um, some of your your tax monies. The other thing we've done in ten years, we've eliminated. Um, and we were doing that through, you know, retirements and so on and so forth. But we actually have 21 full-time, uh, less 21 full-time employees today than we did 10 years ago. So we're, we're, we're doing more with, with less to try to reduce uh, operating expenses and your taxes. So 
just 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 so it's it's, yeah. it's clear for everyone. I mean, we pay for trash based on the weight. So the heavier the trash is, the, the more you pay at the county level. Um, so that's part of you know the analysis and saying we don't want to take all this bulk stuff in, 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 in the regular trash pickup because that adds to the fees. So I would like to add on to that because the whole reason I came tonight was to talk about trash and recycling. It greatly has improved in the 16 years I've lived in this township, and Larry, you have done wonders to get it that way. About 10 years ago, I was on a committee to look at trash and recycling. And I know one of the things the committee talked about was um, implementing sort of a fine system or something for people that don't recycle. One of my biggest pet peeves, and I will admit, I've been known as the box lady of Havertown, um, is that the trash men pick up stuff that should be recycled on trash day. And if our own trash men aren't going to say, no, leave this here until recycling day, the people aren't going to learn. And you just sent out uh, in your newsletter that we had less recycling last year and it caused our trash fees to go up. And what you don't realize is we pay a separate fee for trash. It's not part of our tax dollars. It's a separate fee and your, your bill comes when your tax bill. So I just don't get why we can't do a better job in our trash collection of not taking recyclables on trash day. It just, and, and to say you took apart a grill and bagged it up and threw it out when that's recyclable metal, I, I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, Actually, it's not. That wouldn't be able to go. The, 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 the metal wouldn't be able to go. <laughs> but it, it can be taken for recyclable metal at the plate accurate recycling in Lansdowne. You get paid by the pound. We don't go there. We don't do that anymore. Okay. okay. What, what, stop that number. Yeah. Right. Right. Wait, 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 wait. One, one person at a time. Answer your question. Yeah, and you're, you're right. We do when we get reports, and we, we do. But you got to remember... They're, they have a certain amount of time to get the trash off the street. A lot, I will tell you, though, the majority of the complaints that I received saying your trash service came and they, they picked up my recycling, threw it in the trash. When we get there, in almost 95% of the cases, I will tell you, 95% of the cases, because I'll go out myself. I don't sit in the office. Uh, those who work with me know I'm out on the road. Um, there, when you look into the recycling container, there's things in there that are not recyclables. And, they, and, they, and we're getting penalized. The bad thing now is the economy has changed in such a way where when we were picking up our uh, recycling, even though it still saved a significant amount of money, the market has changed. So we're actually paying about twenty-one to $30,000 a year now disposal to dispose of our single stream recycling. And unfortunately, I think that trend is going to continue to go. Um, you're right. Only... Uh, we we put on a we had an existing employee who works about 20 hours a week and he would do um, specific uh, special projects for us and he's doing a project for us now where he's actually monitoring by ward those particular residents who are continually not putting any making an effort to recycle and we're trying to do it in a, a diplomatic way. Right. I, I'm work, I work with the, I'm working with the EAC. Um, they put together for me, to save me some time, they put together a nice letter and an informational brochure, and we commit it, um, and every resident in the entire township, by the end of May, will receive a letter and two recycling stickers uh, in the mail for free. That it's going to go out, hopefully, the last week of May. We already have um, close to 36,000 uh, recycling stickers, and we're going to continue to promote, continue to work with the staff. Well, I get that, but like I we discussed back then, Philadelphia is a humongous city, and they can find people for putting recyclables in their trash. But you're talking to the wrong person. I know. No, 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 no. Excuse me, but you can't find people, so let's right. not find well, people, yeah. let's just notice them and say, this is why our trash fee goes up every year, because you're not putting your recyclables in recyclables. Well, 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 the simplest thing, like, I, I look at it, I look at a lot of things, and we, what, what you got to do is you got to sort of build. A, if, if the only issue was people not recycling, then we would have no room for improvement. The, the biggest area, and, and this shocked me since I started, um, the biggest area we have is for improvement from the calls that I've gotten 
is that people are putting out recycling and they sort of expect the trash people to know that it's recycling because it's set five feet away or something. And they don't use the stickers or they don't use the trash can. Like, I, it, it, yeah. that baffled me, that but baffled. it happens yeah. all the time. So what we have to, as a township, need to do is do, and what Larry's talking about, mm -hmm. is do a better job of getting the message out that you need, it's not enough to just write recycle and black marker on a trash can and expect the guys who are doing 200 houses in a morning to look at each trash can and as they're running up the street and, and figure out which is which. You have to use the sticker or you have to use the cane. And that's how you, you, we would improve those numbers. True, but picking up a cardboard box on the ground and putting it in a trash truck instead of the recycling truck is your own vision. As it, long as as long as the cardboard box doesn't exactly. have styrofoam in it. Right. Yeah. Right. Then, and styrofoam right. then has to go into the trash. And and, and just I, I just want to add, um, you know, this is not Larry's purview, but no. the cost of recycling will continue to go up oh. and, and I for one does it not mean we're gonna cut back on recycling. No, 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 because it's still beneficial. <laughs> right. I, I rather I rather pay Amy was at twelve dollars a ton right now. Oh, Larry, 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 I know, and that's and that's yeah. your job. But right. I'm saying there's benefits to recycling yeah. beyond just the oh, cost. Sure. <laughs> yes, there is. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. There's, there's also, just so you know, there are some of us. I'm one who believes we need to do enforcement. There are some of our colleagues, and they're not in this room, who would also, if you if did enforcement, would call and say, "Why are you doing that?" Right. I, 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 we recycle a, t a ton of stuff at my house. We we always do, and you I believe see, in it. Um, Dan, we have the, the stickers now. We have stickers that we put on the on the cans, and we'll write. And the, the driver has, it's the driver's responsibility, not the collector. The driver has to get out, mark the mark the container, and the reason why. And then usually, uh, the commissioner will call me and say, "You forgot to pick up the driver." Yeah, well, George. Yeah, I've just got a, a question on the styrofoam that you mentioned. That is a lot of the styrofoam now has the triangles on saying that they are recyclable. Seeing that uh, even though they have the, the triangles, you don't recycle them? C currently, our collector in King of Prussia, yeah, they won't, still won't okay. accept them. Well, then I think we need better education as well. You have confusion within this room, let alone within the township. I thought the metal from his grill could also go into recycling. Not, not the single stream recycling, absolutely not, now. Well, we need to be educated then. Well, I'm I mean, we do. On the recycling calendar, it lists the specific types of things. And in fact, this year I cleaned it up so it was even more legible on the calendars. But it does list exactly those things. And in bold, no styrofoam of any kind in recycling. It's cans, which is aluminum, steel, and bimetal food and drink cans only. So we're trying, but I don't think most people read the, the calendars. You know. And again, right. every household will get another brand new information sheet put together for me by the EAC and two brand new recycling stickers, and we hope that'll help. Can I ask a question about the scrap metal? Um, has the town, you sort of mentioned in passing that you don't collect that anymore, but you may be used to. I'm we wondering. used to, they used to have containers around, and then we, we had to stop that because it became a dump site. Yeah. And then we, then we would find um, uh, dishwashers and refrigerators Mini refrigerator, right. and then it becomes the township's responsibility to dispose of it. It's a hazardous waste. And, okay. um, what, uh, how long ago was that? Uh, when did we stop that? Probably well, about. I just I've heard of other townships having like a a big bin, you know, like say at the municipal building where people can drop. Well, we still have bins, but it's and you will find. Um, I don't think there's any town in Delaware County that will have bins where you can put. Um, uh, pretty much becomes a dumpster. Uh, they won't put that. We have. Our recycling bins that are still down on Hilltop Road, uh, they've been down there for about two years now, and that's uh, paper, glass, single stream recycling. The dumpsters are enclosed to prevent people from putting dishwashers and large bike mark I just want to mention the difference between 18,000 homes only disposing of 50 grills a year is the unofficial bulk pickup. <laughs> right, which people put it on, put their grill on the curb, and they cross their fingers, and at the end, by the end of the weekend, it's gone. Okay, there's scrap metal. Yeah, the people that go around and collect like scrap metal. metal. You're right. You have a physical bulk backup. Right. That's that's what's still there once in a while. Right. Because yeah, okay. there's definitely not more. I want to take a couple more questions, and then, um, and if you have questions that aren't answered, you know. 
you can email us. We'll try to take them here, but it is it's getting close to nine, and Thank I, you. Some, and, me, and some of our people have a ride to get home. So go ahead, now go ahead. No, just when you're speaking of dumpsters, is there an ordinance about how long you can keep a dumpster in your driveway? Yes. We have a neighbor who's had it there about three months across the street from us. Yeah. Um, they put siding up, and then they didn't finish it. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's somebody in the family who's doing it, but this gigantic dumpster has been in the right. driveway for about three months. I had forwarded that along. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, let me switch topics a little bit. Um, a question for the uh, commissioner is about uh, Daniel and Kevin. Um, obviously, my concerns are economic development and enhancement of the business districts and whatnot. Um, obviously, I think we're in, in, undergoing a, a comprehensive plan right now, and I'm just curious if, if the comprehensive plan will include uh, built to be, Include economic development and, and the parking study. I don't know enough about it. The comprehensive plans, but are you are you both? You know, is there a status on where? That I'd is? actually defer that to Lori to answer. So the comprehensive plan obviously will include an economic development. I don't think I've ever seen a comprehensive plan that doesn't include what economic development. Even the one that we have now does have an economic development section in it, but it's not as comprehensive as it should be. So we're going to work to improve that um, economic development. So, And actually did have a conversation with one of your friends, Chris Gallen, about possibly sitting on the committee um, for the for this comprehensive plan, which we're, we're doing in partnership, we think, with Bradner Township. Um, and the other issue that you asked about was a parking study. I don't know if they're included or not, Lori. The said. parking study typically isn't, and um, you know, parking studies can be pretty pricey uh, in and of themselves. Um, it, they look at the overall inventory of parking, both private and public, uh, for and not on somebody's residential property, but um, within a non-residential use, what available parking there might be, as well as what public parking might be in that area, and the street parking, what street parking, and all of that is inventoried and identified, and then they look at what the anticipated usage is and where there's, it's, it's a weighted calculation where there's an, a need for additional parking. So it's pretty intensive in terms of doing it unless you just simply do aerial scans, which a lot of people are just doing the aerials now. Any other questions? Sir? Yeah, uh, Frank Davenhart, Marple Road, Fourth Ward. Uh, one request and one question. Request. Uh, on Darby Creek Road, do we have an abandoned uh, sofa, uh, 2100 block? Can we get that picked up? What's your address? We'll put it on your front lawn there. <laughs> and uh, the uh, question I had was, um, and I want to thank everybody for having this meeting. Uh, we used to have community service years ago. I haven't seen them around lately. Uh, there, uh, uh, we, we used them last year. Um, they're, they're, they, they, the uh, county does. It's not as um, Prevalent? Yeah. Yeah. Robust. Yeah. Robust as it was. Right. I mean, there was uh, uh, there was a gentleman that coordinated, took a lot of uh, um, personal time to work with the program at a county level, and I don't think he's there anymore. Uh, I know that we, if we want to do a, a yearly, like a lot of times, we'd have them walking up and down Glendale Road, the state roads, picking up trash. We will call them. Problem is, we have to take a one of our employees and assign an employee to that. Group and it actually costs us money, but we do use them not as not as much as we've done in the past, but they they still stall around. Okay. Um, Peter Hickman on Marble Road. I, I wasn't here for part of it, but I was talking about the uh, the township website. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in I, terms of improving it. Yeah. Um, I know that we have we have a part time person that's doing that. No, full time. Um, no, she's become full time. Full time. Okay. The the township is getting there. The website has been, and I think yeah. I can. I think I'm correct here. Yeah. The well, let me just give you the context. Originally, when I ten years ago, we didn't have anyone 
really dealing with that on any full-time basis. Last year, the township, uh, when Larry talks about that we have fewer employees, but over last year we added a part-time employee who's now a full-time employee who handles social media. If you have not seen or have not followed the township on Facebook, you should. She's doing a really good job there. Um, she films the commissioner meetings and a lot of other things. Um, so she does all of that and has taken on some roles on the website. But the website right now is managed by a third-party company at a fairly overpriced cost. And the goal is to eventually transition that to a site that the township can manage and be more updated. I know they're trying. Yeah, they're trying. And right now what her, our initiative is for her to go in and organize, there's things that were just old data she's actually going in, making sure anything, we've controlled it. Where right now, before it used to be department, department specific. So the fonts were different and it, information would never get taken off. So now everything has to go through this one uh, individual, which is uh, uh, Alexandra. Uh, so she coordinates all. As far as redoing the website, it's not going to be a task that we'll take on until the new municipal services building uh, is up and operational. That project alone, relocating all of the, um, the servers and, and the electronics and getting the police department up and running for it is going to be enormous. And that we're looking at probably September. Yeah. Well, well, police are September. Okay. Right? The rest of us will be January. Yeah, January. yeah I, I say May. Um, that's yeah. 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 But, it's not yeah. going to be back. No. <laughs> but the goal is to improve all of the township's sort of <coughs> internet technology and communications. They use constant contact in addition to the phone calls. Um, they're, they're committed to doing all of those things. But we have one employee, and she's, I think she's doing a terrific job. Yeah. But it takes time. Well, am I correct if I, if I recall when we were discussing sort of the architecture of the new building that IT and technology is the only township department that actually has more space right. in the new building. Yeah. Um, you, know, the, you know, the trend in workplaces is to sort of reduce the size of office space um, and that we're going to do that with the police and we're going to do that with all the township employees as we combine them all into the municipal services building. But the IT and technology actually is going to expand the amount of space they have. Um, with the with the thought process that down the road we're, we're hopefully we'll be able to we'll, we'll not be able to but we'll also have the need to hire more people to, to work in that sphere because the need will increase. Media growth. Right. I mean, we're, we're, I, I think the one area you know I, I try to I don't like to micromanage, mm -hmm. but I push the most. I, I don't think it's a shock to anyone that I like technology quite a lot and like to use it. Um, but I want the township to, and they've, they've taken great strides. The, you know, they're virtually paperless. Um, the communication is so much more efficient than it ever was. The finances are streamlined electronically. Uh, so there's a lot of synergy there and there's a lot of saving, but it takes time to transition. And then, you know, moving to a new building and doing all of that, which will also mean moving all the cable facilities and all those things, it's a, it's a big project. And we have a much smaller staff. You know, we have, I forget, three people essentially on our staff. Well, and Lower Marion has seven. seven. Um, and, you know, and we had two before that. So we're growing, but it takes time. And, but you know, as long as I'm around, you know, we're going to, I will, oh, I will push technology. You know, I love it. And I think it really can improve. I think, you know. The communication with the township is dramatically better because of technology, and you know if you I, I mean this if you have not followed the township's own Facebook and the police departments, you really should because there is a ton of information that is going out on a regular basis, and it's information you would want to know. It's not, you know, fluff. fluff thank you. Uh, so they really are committed to it and. It, it's, it's, I think it's working. I mean, I'm finding out things, I'm like, oh, I didn't know this. And that's good, because that says they're on top of things. And that wasn't the case, you know, a year or two ago. You, you, you know, Facebook, if there was something, was the last place to look. So really follow that. It, it will make a difference. <laughs> and with that, Thank everyone for I coming. Want, Obviously, you know, if... if if there's a question that you didn't want to ask in a public setting like this, or if you have a neighbor that couldn't come and 
he or she has a question, um, feel free to contact Dan or I. And well, we'll were you going to give an update on the time frame for the municipal services and the library? I thought you said that at the beginning of the meeting. Oh, sure. Like the, the police will move in. Uh, the, right, right now, the police are scheduled to move in at the end of September. Into the beginning of September, we're told. And, um, you know, they, they have to move in for certain purposes right, right. that involve the police. And then the township employees and uh, Parks and Rec should be moving in. We're hoping now January, right? Well, it's we're targeting December. Right. We have other work to do January. on this site. We have to break down the old police department once we move the new police in, them into the new police department, and we have to do demolition. So we have some hazardous materials abatement on that property, and then we have to construct that one main drive in and some lower level parking and um, so we have a, a good bit of um, construction activities that will follow up so occupancy December to January um, but we'll be cleaning up in January hopefully and then the library the plan is that they will use the township building yeah. and so that they can begin their construction but they can't begin anything until the township is fully out and we have a timetable and you know we're we're a little behind, but you know we don't. You, you can't do anything. One can't happen until the other. Okay. Right. So is this going to be like the circulation area of the library, and they're going to? Store? That's up to the oh, library. Okay. Well, but so so the the rationale, just so everyone understands, is the the library. There's studies that when the library closes for eleven to thirteen months, or however long it would take, that you people find other places to get. Library services, and then it's hard to attract them back. So the idea is they would have a temporary location during any construction that they did to offer some services. Now they can use these buildings for um, essentially free, not free, but essentially free, or they would pay a significant amount of money to lease space. So that that's that's the rationale of using these facilities. You know, they'll, they'll, they're going to take the space and they'll configure it how they. To, to offer some of the services as best they can, um, but you know we're certainly not going to be forcing them to or, or telling them okay. how they need to configure the space. Yeah. They have a separate board, even though we appoint members, they are separate. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for coming and thank the township officials. Lori <laughs> Ridoff.